Hi, I'm Kevin and welcome to my channel. Today I'm once again out in the field with a mentor of mine, Malcolm Squires. Malcolm is a forester who spent a lot of time managing this land base and in 1983 he planted this site. He had a lot of challenges and he overcame those challenges. We're going to talk about that and we're also going to talk about Michael Reisel Association in Spruce. <music> standing in a plantation of black spruce trees. I'm going to lead us through how this plantation got started and why. In 1980, Abbott Tibby Price Incorporated signed a forest management agreement with the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources in which the company would take responsibility for regenerating the areas that it was cutting over. Much of the area that it had cut over in the past had not regenerated satisfactorily and was called what foresters called not sufficiently restocked or NSR. And one of the first priorities that the company was given was to restock this background unregenerated area. So we're standing on a piece of that right now. It's on a very productive piece of soil. In fact, some of the most fertile soils that are on what we now know as the Spruce River Forest. It had a lot of competition on the ground already, uh, from shrubs, dense herbs, grasses, but more importantly, shrubby trees, uh, like mountain maple, uh, red old deer dogwood, uh, hazel, beaked hazel. So we knew that Black spruce planted seedlings were not going to perform very well if we just planted them in that. So we had to get rid of all this competition. And we wanted to make an impression, a positive impression on the people of Ontario. Because at that time, the people of Ontario correctly had a very poor impression of what was going on in our forest. It was not being regenerated sufficiently. So we decided that we were going to put everything we had into this piece of ground to make a successful plantation. So I think I should provide just a little bit more context here. Back in the 80s, there were no textbooks or guidelines on how to renew the forest. Foresters like Mac were figuring this out as they went. So the story you're going to hear Mac tell is one of a very intensive effort to renew this site. It's not the kind of series of, of treatments we would prescribe these days, um, but back in the day, this was a necessary learning experience to understand um, how the different site preparation and different treatments can uh, affect renewal. Well, are you ready for this? First, we had to use 240 chemical herbicide to kill off all of the hardwood vegetation. We did that in the summer of 1982. After the brush was killed, we brought in a huge Martin chopper. That's a machine with two big rolling drums that's hauled behind a D8 tractor. And those drums together weighed 30 tons. And they had 16 inch deep blades on them. As they rolled, they chopped up the soil and they broken, broke up the dead vegetation, much of it even trees this size. That was 1982. Spring of 1983, we had grown black spruce seedlings at Hills Greenhouses in Murillo in paper pot containers. Those containers were not looked upon favorably by a lot of people, but we had had the experience of seeing what Irving was doing in New Brunswick uh, very successfully and the Finns were doing it in Finland with the paper pot so we took the gamble that that was our method. So in May of 1983 with unionized planters from our logging group we planted those trees. I did miss a, 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 another site preparation here. We also followed up the Marden shopping with a bracky patch scar fire because the Marden didn't create planting spots, we felt, but the, Marden, the uh, bracky created bare spots in the ground. It had a, a dragging wheels and scalpers that scalped up a sod, left some bare soil and accumulation of a sod and mixed so mineral soil and organic matter. 
This is a modern Bracky patch scarifier. It has these matic wheels which uh, rotate slowly. They drag and then they rotate, creating a scalp and a mound. We directed the planters to plant the seedling right under the edge of the turned up sod where it was going to get its roots into the mixture of soils. And you can still see some faint evidence of these mounds today right beside a few of the planted trees. And in a few spots you can even see the evidence of the Marden chopper. So yes, come 1983 we're now planting the trees. We put out approximately 2,160 trees per hectare. I think you'll see most of them are probably here. Then, come 1985, two years after we planted, the creation of the cutover and the use of the herbicide previous years, we ended up with a stand of blue joint grass this tall around our planted seedlings. Huh. What are you going to do? Oh, the federal government had just approved the use of Roundup in forestry. Oh. And we applied it in August of 1985. Instant kill of the grass and our trees showed up. Oh, great. Because the previous two years, the grass had fallen over with the snow weight and damaged a lot of our seedlings. We had a lot of criticism because we had been, what we had been doing up to this point. Number one, overkill with all the site preparation that created the grass problem. And, uh, oh well, there were so many other criticisms that uh, we were beginning to feel like, uh, hmm, what are we going to do here? Well, after we finished with the roundup, we did nothing else. And what you see here is the result of that after this is the 39th year. A former logging superintendent for a, a company who delivered saw logs to his mill said, what? This is in 2017. What are we saying here? 34 years after a plantation, you've got a saw log stand. It would take 70 plus years on a site like this normally after a fire to create a saw log stand. Wow, something we did was right. All the criticism we had received appears to have been for naught. We even have a, a bear hunter has been here bear, baiting bears. I've come across white deer bones that obviously had been wolf killed. I've got photographs of moose shortly after the roundup was sprayed in the cutover. And regardless of all that, we have this stand. I'm, to say, just a little bit proud of this. <laughs> I think I should be. However, one thing we've been discovering here is mushrooms. Lots of mushrooms. Not a whole lot this year, but last year the ground was just littered with them. And uh, we've discovered that those mushrooms are the fruiting bodies of fungi that are complementary to the black spruce trees. Not all of them, some of them are litter decomposers, but a great number of them are a variety of species of symbiotic mushroom fungi, commonly known today as mycorrhizal fungi. They pick up the water and mineral from the soil and through their uh, hyphae, we'll call them, uh, uh, they connect to the roots of the black spruce trees. They deliver water and nutrients to the trees. In return, the trees deliver sugar that they've generated from photosynthesis. They deliver it to the fungi. And those fungi actually might be connecting up to a different species of plant a white birch tree, or maybe even some brush tree species. And everybody here is benefiting from helping each other. Wow, if only humanity always did that. But anyway, here we are in this plantation. The day Mac and I visited the site was late in the season, but we believe we, we found both saprophytic fungi like this, which decompose dead matter, as well as other um, mycorrhizal fungi.
But Mac has been visiting this site for almost 40 years now, and he's been looking for mushrooms almost every time he visits. He's uh, And he's found many, and he's had them classified by experts and found that there's quite a diversity of mycorrhizal fungi on this site. Today, we realize that in clear cutting, we're probably preventing a lot of the mycorrhizae uh, fungi from surviving. They need the trees to be able to survive. So if we wait too long after we cut, we lose a lot of those and we don't get the benefit of the mycorrhizae. So what we're doing today is we're leaving more trees in the cutovers so that they can help sustain those fungi. I think we're doing a good job of it. It's really interesting too to see all the um, published material in the press today about this symbiotic relationship. Uh, one in specific, one specific book that's been uh, published by uh, Suzanne Samard is uh, Finding the Mother Tree. It's a very interesting read and it's uh, done a lot to get mycorrhizae into the public view and knowledge. And I'm sure in the long term it's going to help us do more research about the benefits of it. And we still have a whole lot of questions about how we should be operating to enhance the benefits of those things. So we need a lot more research. and. With this knowledge in the public, we're probably going to get the support politically. I hope so. We've moved to another stand now from the one we were just shooting in. This is a plantation, actually a part of the same plantation, planted the same year, the same planting stock. The difference is that we've chosen this spot to look at because it was completely clear-cut at the time of the harvest. It was NSR and not sufficiently restocked in the inventory, but there were no residual trees. We are standing in the stand now then, and the trees are definitely smaller. There's a bit more aspen, but despite the fact that the area had been sprayed also with Roundup in 1985, but the stocking is not quite as tight. Even with that wider spacing, the diameter of the trees, most of the trees is smaller than in the previous stand where there were residuals left when we did the harvest. So the question is, why are these trees smaller? Is it because there were no residuals to sustain the mycorrhiza in the soil? Or is the site actually poorer? To the best of my recollection, the site was identical to the previous one we looked at. Similar soils, fairly fine, and the, the trees that were harvested here were very large, thrifty. So, why are these trees smaller? Question I don't have the answer to. But I am suspicious. It has something to do with the lack of trees to sustain the mycorrhizae in the soil. A bit of background on our story that we're hearing here today. I'm going to bring in a personality. First, when we started trying to figure out what we were going to do here at Abitibi, we were going to pretty well knocked down everything with our Martin Chopper. However, Roy Klein, who was the, at the time, the area forester with the Ministry of Natural Resources and responsible for FMA, Roy was, uh, unfortunately, has passed away. But at that time, he figured quite largely in what was going on in forestry in the Thunder Bay area. And he and I came down and sized up what the conditions were on this NSR and we discussed what we should be doing. I told him my intention was to put him all clear on everything. And Roy said, Mac, 
I wonder. I'm not so confident that you're going to succeed here in getting a fully stocked stand. So, you see all those white spruce and jack pine trees here, the residuals. Why don't you try to preserve those? They might help regenerate the area if your plantation is not a full success. Well, 39 years later, I look back. Roy probably was not thinking at all of what the benefits of the trees might be beyond the seed source. I suspect he never thought at all of what impact it might have on sustaining the underground fungi, the mycorrhizae benefits. However, looking back today, I'm quite grateful we had that discussion and that Roy made that recommendation. It was the first of many recommendations that Roy made to us. And am I ever grateful that we worked together, worked out our difficulties, and came to conclusions that we see these positive results of today. All right, thanks a lot for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you got something out of this. If you did, please hit like, share, and subscribe. As always, have a great day, and we'll see you in the next one.